Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In one of our recent videos where we talked about the evolution of Starship designs, one of our viewers, Willity, asked the following question. Oh, Alan the Great and Wise, the Dreadnought part got me wondering, what kind of man hours were involved on making even the smallest of these? What labor-saving technical advantages were there in comparison to making Earth's largest wet navy ships, the aircraft carriers? Is there an existing video answering? these questions. Well, Willity, first of all, that's an awesome name. And no, there aren't any videos about that, but it doesn't mean we can't do one right now. Let's take a look at why it's much easier than you think to build a Star Wars-sized dreadnought in the Star Wars galaxy. So first of all, those Star Wars-sized dreadnoughts are absolutely massive. I mean, just an Imperial-class Star Destroyer, which is more of a regular ship of a line and not a dreadnought, is around 1.6 kilometers or one mile long. That completely dwarfs the USS Gerald R. Ford, which is only around 333 meters or 1,092 feet in length. The Imperial class Star Destroyer is five times the length of the aircraft carrier and many times the volume. It's simply massive. The Ford is pretty close to one of the largest naval vessels built here on Earth. There are bigger oil tankers like the 468 meter Seawise Giant and other large ships that carry freight. But the thing is, the ISD is not even the top 10 biggest mass-produced starship in galactic history. I mean, the Trade Federation Lucre Hulk freighter was 3,170 meters in length. The resurgent class battle cruiser used by the First Order, 2,915 meters in length. The Manator IV class siege dreadnought, well, that was 7,669 meters long. Then you have the Executor class Super Star Destroyer, which was 19 kilometers long, and the Mega class Star Dreadnought Supremacy, which had a 60 kilometer wingspan. We're talking about city sized constructions here. How do they do this? First, the most obvious thing is just the scale of how large the Star Wars galaxy is. Um, humans were just a small drop in the Milky Way. There are thousands of different civilizations that are advanced enough to create lip-sync battle-level variety shows for entertainment on TV. A true sign of high intellect and self-awareness. Earth in the Star Wars galaxy would be considered a relatively sparsely developed and medium to low sized population planet with just around 8 billion humans and around 10 million dolphins of various species a number that increases at a rapid rate we're like the only channel that talks about this i don't know why that is but let's spread the awareness the most populated planet in the galaxy coruscant has a population of 2 trillion although that's more like an estimate there's just way too many underground layers on this planet i mean we're talking about thousands of levels here so no one really knows what the true population is and then we have naboo which is on the smaller scale it's been called a small pastoral world by travel and leisure it has a population close to earth at around 4.5 billion with a quarter of them being humans, and the rest being dark side aligned Gungans. Now, if we take a look at the manufacturer of the Imperial class Star Destroyer, Quad Drive Yards, this is a massive corporation, unlike anything we have here on Earth. Because we're not just talking about a global company, like you know, Apple or Microsoft, uh, KDY actually makes up a huge percentage of the entire planet of Quad's GDP, and they probably employ a massive amount of people as well. As a matter of fact, Quad Drive Yards was founded by the founders of the planet, a group of aristocrats known as the Ten. And they actually terraformed this world to make it into a paradise, and a huge part of generating revenue for this planet was building a massive orbital shipyard. The idea from the very beginning was to design the most efficient shipmaking company in the galaxy. As a result, this company is deeply connected to the government structure. You can actually say that KDY is a government-run entity, as it took the entire planet's resources to build this gigantic shipyard. And this company would service the entire galaxy uh, for thousands of years. We're talking about a market much older and much larger than anything here on Earth. And their specialty was always building massive starships that were usually over a thousand meters long. Many of the ships we mentioned in the earlier section of our video were made on KDY. Even when the galaxy was completely demilitarized during the Rusan Reformation, Quad Drive Yards was one of the last shipyards really to make capital ships and large dreadnoughts. Part of that was uh, KDY's own internal planetary defense force needed these large ships, and there were also a few rich core worlds that actually ordered ships of this size. But more importantly, KDY also built commercial and civilian ships. If you take a look at large defense contractors in our own world, like Newport News Shipbuilding, they construct basically two types of vessels. One is an aircraft carrier, and the second one is a nuclear submarine, both of which are the most advanced in the world. But the cost for making these ships is ridiculously high because they only make a handful of them 
every decade. And Newport News has also gotten rid of their civilian and commercial construction side of the business. Diversifying what you make gives you the opportunity to scale up your production and fund your R&D with other products. Newport News Shipbuilding is now hyper-focused on just making these two types of vessels. For instance, they're only going to be making roughly 10 Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carriers, which is a relatively small order, but you know, considering how big these ships are, that kind of makes sense. And so you're not really going to be able to scale up much here. And a lot of the technologies on these ships, like the electromagnetic aircraft launch system, is proprietary and built specifically for this ship. And so all of this technology is going to be super expensive, and it's going to be really costly when it fails. Boeing, which is really just an awful company, is actually one of the most profitable defense companies in the world. And that's because they make an equal amount of commercial products as they do military products. They also have that duopoly for manufacturing airliners with Airbus, especially after the two companies brought out Bombardier and Embraer. Now, Quad Drive Yards, on the other hand, built tens of thousands of Imperial class Star Destroyers. They were able to significantly reduce the cost of these ships to roughly 150 million credits per unit. So we did a comparison between the US dollar and the galactic credit almost like a decade ago. We used a consumer price index and also a sheet that had prices for various commodities in the Star Wars galaxy. We found out that the credit and the dollar are basically one to one. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, inflation recently. So even if you increase that by like 100% and make it like two to one, the ISD, which is five times longer and many times the size of an aircraft carrier, would cost only the equivalent of 300 million US dollars. Whereas the Gerald R. Ford cost about $13 billion or 40 times the price. So why is this? Well, KDY is not only building thousands, uh, tens of thousands of these ISDs, the company is also completely vertically integrated with hundreds of smaller subsidiaries and investments in supply chain and resource extraction. When you have a contract as large and as long as the empire has given to KDY, you can purchase entire planets full of resources in expectation of what you're going to build. KDY actually has several planets in its asset list, including the planet of Rothana, where it hides some of its some of its more secretive projects. You can then extract said resources and process them at your own refineries and manufacture them at your own factories, cutting out the middleman at every step of the way. And without any major competitors, you're able to vertically integrate your company, a uh, plan long-term like this without too much of a risk. It's not just about the scale of how big we're doing things, it's also about industrial manufacturing technology, and the Star Wars Galaxy is far ahead of our own. But we are making leaps and bounds in more recent times. For instance, Tesla is pioneering a technology called megacasting. Instead of assembling dozens of different parts into the body of a car, you can have a machine, Tesla's is called the Gigapress, that makes one large aluminum piece that condenses all of the individual pieces together into one large structure. If you take a look at this picture here, the Model Y only needs two pieces compared to 171 individual pieces on the Model 3, which results in 1,600 fewer welds, a lot of saved time and weight. There are, of course, some disadvantages to every new manufacturing capability. Tesla has actually cut back on its investment in megacasting in its new factories. This could just be the general downturn in the EV industry as a whole, a part of a wider economic cycle. There are also concerns that having one large piece replace so many individual components could make it a lot more difficult to fix these uh, pieces in case of a collision. You can't just swap out a few parts, you'd have to swap out the whole thing. At that point, you're just going to basically write the vehicle off as a wreck. That actually might be better for automakers so they could sell more cars. And while Tesla has slowed down its investment in megacasting, other automakers like Volvo and Mercedes have heavily invested in the technology. It's technologies like this that will make our design stronger and lighter in the future. And if you take a close look at Tesla's factories, notice how few people are actually working on the assembly line. You have mostly robotic arms and conveyor belts. It kind of looks like the Geonosian factories we see in episode two. In Star Wars, not only do you see very few people working on assembly lines, you see all sorts of cheaper methods of labor. Like if we take a look at the Death Star program, they literally use the combination of droids for space work and slaves or prisoners for assembling parts. It's the most dystopian combination of automation and zero workers rights. It's the empire for you. Now, of course, car manufacturing is pretty simple and less expensive when compared to building a starship. And in our own world, actually the best analog for it is not building large naval vessels, but I think building 
large buildings, uh, skyscrapers, stuff like that. Actually, the Mon Calamari cruisers we see the Rebels use were formerly underwater civic buildings converted into star cruisers, believe it or not. And if you take a look at how skyscrapers are built today, one of the biggest advancements is modular construction, where you have prefabricated apartment buildings that are stacked together almost like Legos. If you actually take a look at the construction of a skyscraper, it actually takes a pretty short amount of time to put up the foundation and the structure itself. Most of the time is spent on actually uh, doing the individual units, you know, putting up drywall, doing the flooring, doing the windows, painting everything, uh, electrical, plumbing, putting in the appliances, all that other stuff. That costs a lot more time and manpower. And so having everything prefabricated saves you a considerable amount of time. If you take a look at something like the Imperial Class Star Destroyer or something larger like a Dreadnought, I'm almost 100% sure they have prefabricated units that are connected to each other while in space. They're not going to be doing all of that while the ship is in a dry dock or in a space dock. Especially if you're mass manufacturing these ships, that's how you save tons of manpower hours and credits. Now here on Earth, we are seeing the consolidation of manufacturing to a certain extent at the city level, which is a good step forward for efficiency and reduction of cost. If you go to North Carolina, for instance, there's a few cities there that build the majority of the furniture in all of the United States. And so if you're looking for good furniture at a pretty low cost, I recommend you flying or driving there and ordering it directly from the factories. There's also that famous city in Dongguan in China who's known for making the majority of shoes that come out of China, or Yiwu, China's Christmas village where the majority of the world's Christmas decorations and accessories are created. Actually, China has leapt forward in an almost terrifying way when it comes to the consolidation of production in just one town. This has to do a lot with government organization, I believe. They have a city that just does solar panels, a city that just does batteries. You know, environmental reasons aside, if you can find a large enough customer base, when you scale up things to this size, you're gonna get better products, usually for a much cheaper price. So the last kind of problem we have here on Earth when it comes to building something the size of a super star destroyer is something that most large vehicles struggle with on Earth, and that is gravity. It holds us down, it limits the size of things we want to build, but suddenly when you escape the gravity well of a planet and enter zero gravity or near zero gravity, building things at a large scale becomes incredibly easy. Instead of using massive cranes and machines to hold up the superstructure of some vehicle, you now simply need some you know, rocket boosters or thrusters to move them around. It's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot more energy efficient. I've always said that for humanity to colonize our orbits and nearby solar systems, it'll happen extremely quickly once we put the initial investment into some orbital infrastructure. It's just that initial investment is going to be very costly. For instance, right now, it costs tens of thousands of dollars to push material into low orbit. Thanks to recent private government partnerships, that cost is going down drastically. But once again, once we build that first permanent industrial orbital shipyard, once we can start carrying out expeditions to survey and mine for minerals from asteroids and process that material into ore and complete the manufacturing process all in space, we no longer will have to fight that costly battle against gravity to, you know, pay massive amounts of money and fossil fuels to get just a kilo of material up into space, we'll be able to tap into what the galaxy has to offer us, and there's a lot of material out there, guys. It's possible that one asteroid could have enough of a certain type of metal, like iron or tungsten or maybe even gold, to completely devalue that commodity on Earth. It's possible that in the future, we'll no longer even have to have environmentally damaging resource extraction projects here on Earth. Everything is out there in the stars. And once we have a system set up, ideally using as many automated drones and machines as possible, we'll be able to build ships the size of cities quicker than you think. You know, a lot of people get down about technology, and I get it, it's a part of human nature. A common complaint about NASA is that why spend money funding an agency that tries to convince us the world is round and not a gigantic disc with ice walls surrounding it when I can't even afford groceries. I understand when you have technologies like EV cars or generative AI, it can be scary, especially for those whose jobs and livelihoods might be affected. And trust me, as a video production guy in the early 2000s to 2010s, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew that all the skills I was learning, you know, from steady cam operating to editing, would one day be replaced by better technology, better program software, algorithms, just younger kids willing to do stuff for cheaper. And so I actually switched to content creation, which is a bit more guarded against new technologies. I mean, to a certain degree, but it was overall a good move for me. Uh, it's definitely something I do not regret doing. And the reason I was able to do this was I took a look at how technology was evolving 
and I wasn't afraid of it. Instead, I tried to understand which direction things were going, and I put myself in a position to take advantage of it. You know, I remember back then people also hating the internet. People were upset that we were upgrading to 4K. There are also painters and traditional artists who hated digital design and Photoshop. It's not all that different from the people who hate EV cars like it's their personality today, or people who are trying to ban others from using generative AI when it comes to artwork. Free your own emotions won't get you anywhere in life. It's a far better idea to understand how technology is developing, how it's changing your environment around you, than becoming angry at it. All throughout history, it's those who are able to understand and use new technological advancements to their advantage who have had the best outcomes in life. Just look at the internet age. There were really just two groups of people back then. Individuals who didn't want to use the internet and people who wanted to use the internet. And, you know, ten years later, there was only one group, and that was the people who used the internet. Just one half were early adopters, and... A lot of the individuals who made it a part of their job, a part of their business, banked. The reality is, with a lot of these new technologies, it's not the technology itself we have to fear, it's how our government and labor markets are set up, how our leaders distribute wealth. Too often I see people getting emotional at the technologies themselves instead of the CEOs or politicians who are not regulating these technologies. Because honestly, it doesn't matter how angry you get, how activist you become about a certain thing. Technology will always advance. It doesn't really care about your feelings or emotions. It's not a cold hard truth. It's just about um, being aware of what's going on and you know, changing how you frame things. There's so much negativity, so many angry and cynical people, especially on the internet, who themselves are quite lost trying to convince everyone else to be pessimistic and fearful of the future that has yet to be written. I'm not saying that you should be blindly optimistic about everything, but you definitely should be fearful of stuff, especially during times of great change. Because it's during times of great change where you can really get ahead. You owe it to yourself to be clear-headed, um, curious, and try to investigate these new technologies instead of closing your mind off. Because you might find out that we're pretty close to building Imperial Class Star Destroyers in the very near future, or at least larger spaceships and other kind of cool things like that. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.